Hello there, and welcome to the channel. This is Nerd World History, and I'm continuing my exploration of native Celtic tribes in pre-Roman Britannia and Hibernia. Today, I'm going to be butchering lots of Gaelic pronunciations, so forgive me in advance, I don't speak Gaelic, I don't have the tongue for it, and I'm going to do my best, but I'm going to butcher these pronunciations. I'm looking at the Darini tribe. I think I'm spelling, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I think just pretend there's an, an Irish accent on it. They came from the island state of Hibernia, the place that was not really conquered by the Romans. There was some trade, a bit of overlap. They were mentioned periodically throughout history, particularly in the second century, uh, which we'll get to. But they were a tribe of pre-Roman Britain. Now, to be clear, Ireland, and although I have some Irish ancestry, I'm not Irish. I've never actually been to that country. Kind of wish I had. It's a beautiful country from what I understand. But, um, yeah. The Irish are, or at least they are di more direct descendants of a true Celtic heritage. As a result, it's a bit of a mess trying to sift through the interconnectivity of the rising and falling tribes. We actually know more about them, but in that way, sorting through it becomes infinitely more complicated. So, sticking to the basic rule that I'm having of it being pre-Roman, which means that any of the rising Celtic nations of Ireland that rose during or after the Roman period, I might mention, but I'm not going to directly explore. The Darini were a tribe that dates to at least the 1st century BC, which makes them pre-Roman. They were mentioned by the Romans, so they were still around during the Roman period. But in later periods, and here we go with the butchering of pronunciations, they would form into a confederacy of with other Celtic tribes of Northern Ireland, which is where they were from. They, they are located on the west coast of Northern Ireland. They would become part of... Now, someone correct me, because I can't find a proper pronunciation of this. Ulaid? Ule? I'm not too sure. It's, it's spelled like this. And they are... That is the ancestral kingdom of what is now known as Ulster, which it derives its name from. There are some weird connections. That being Celtic, and there's, as I've mentioned in other videos, there is a lot of connection to Scotland. In Glencoe in Scotland, there's actually... I'm not even going to try this one. This is a mountain in Scotland, which shares a similar name. So, there's a lot of overlap. As I said, between Scotland and Ireland, they have a much richer Celtic heritage than we do in England or even in Wales, particularly in England, where our Celtic ancestry, our Celtic heritage has been practically erased, as Tolkien basically is quite famous for trying to create English mythology in the Lord of the Rings books, because realistically our own mythology has been diluted or lost, due to wave after wave after wave of invaders. We've had Vikings, we've had um, Normans, we've had Romans. There has been a lot of German influence, of course, with the Angles, Saxons and Jutes, as well as others. There's also been Danish invasions, which technically would still count as Viking. And of course, there's a lot of overlap with Wales, Scotland, and even Ireland, and generally with the French, with the Normans being a culturally contaminated Viking culture blurred with French culture which then invaded us and we became a blur of that. So Anglo-Saxon culture as they like to call it is it has no history of its own in a lot of ways. A lot of the things we know as our own history are often folk tales and stories that come from other lands such as Germany. Getting past that little point we'll get started on the Darini tribe. Please like, share, subscribe and comment down below. That's a really long intro. I didn't mean it to be that long. Right then. This is as I said a complicated one. The Darini are referenced in Ptolemy's geography in the 2nd century AD as a tribe that existed in Hibernia. He was basically making a map of all the different peoples everywhere and their references living there then. Before that, a more recent scholar from about 70 years ago, from when I uploaded this video anyway, 
has made some assertions that perhaps this tribe were descendants of a people who of peoples should I say that came to Ireland from the Belgic areas of Gaul and of Britannia and influenced them into the creation of the Dorini and other tribes settling in the area through trade and other things. Now I should point out that that's a somewhat, I won't say debunked scholarly research. It is considered a foundation of a lot of modern research, but it's, let's say it's, um, it's, it's more of a hypothesis, the hypothesis than a theory. Now the Dorini tribe overall, based on their name, are probably named after a deity known as Dare. Again, that may be a butchering of the pronunciation. The tribe that, that should have rephrased that. The tribal name means basically the high ones or the ones from up high or something along those lines, which is a derivative of another variation in the Celtic language referencing the Brigantes, who are another tribe I've done before, and I did reference with them that there was a connection to a tribe in Northern Ireland, and this is one of them. There, there may have been a genuine historical connection. It, it's not possible to say, but these may have been a sept or another sort of offshoot of that tribe, of away from the Brigantes that came into Ireland and became known as the Dare. The meaning is very similar. The high ones, the people from up high, both named after a god, etc. Now, it's, it is somewhat speculation, but it is possible. Sim we're again going into the murky depths of prehistory, where reading and writing weren't exactly a common thread, which on that I should note that as I'm not a Ro I'm not a pro-Roman historian. I, don't, I, I find the Romans massively overrated. They were very impressive in a lot of ways, but they're often given credit for things they shouldn't be given credit for. For example, building roads, as I've done in the video here, the oldest road in the world was in Britain, and that was a, made, a manufactured road. There were roads here which the Romans simply built on top of. Now, the big ones, like Watling Street, things like that, yes, they built, but the idea of road building was not new. Neither was coinage, neither was reading and writing. Writing existed in Britain before the Romans, and in fact, it had existed in Ireland in a form of writing known as Ogham script. Now, I'm getting a little off track here, but my point is, Ogham script existed. They, they just chose not to write very much down. It is used more in the AD period, but there's some evidence it may have existed in the BC period long before the Romans turned up. But the Druids chose not to write anything down. The Druids were wiped out by the Romans in Anglesey, and what was left of the Druid culture survived on in Ireland and up in Scotland for a while with the Picts, until eventually it phased out with the introduction of Christianity and it becoming more widespread and the Druidic religion and faith fizzled out or integrated somewhat with modern Irish Christianity but generally and into their folklore but generally speaking the religion its oral traditions and everything have all gone. Now again back to the Dorini tribe they were as I said referenced by Ptolemy in the second century AD who referenced about 16 different tribes along the different coast along the various coastlines around Hibernia clearly the Romans are trading with these people now although the Romans never invaded Ireland it's not true to say they never went there the Romans did go to Ireland but only to trade they never went to invade decisions were made at thoughts to invade at one point but considering how hard Britannia had been to annex in the first place. It had taken the Romans over 40 years and they never fully subjugated. They faced rebellions, they faced constant border assaults, etc. They never fully subjugated Britannia, never mind taking the North. Well, again, this is a modern classification, a modern distinction between England and Scotland. There wasn't one back then. There was no England and Scotland. There was just Britannia. It was all one thing. It's sometimes given another name now, but that's more of a reference to the indigenous people cultures that survived on there while the southern Celtic cultures were wiped out, such as calling the, the people from Scotland um, Caledonian, things like that. That was a tribe that survived on in Scotland, but they didn't... It wasn't actually Scotland as a nation as we understand it now. And there was no difference between the Votaduni tribe for example, and the Dabuni tribe of southern England. They were both of the same culture with a similar language. It got wiped out and destroyed by the Romans and then by successive invaders. 
The same thing didn't happen in Ireland, which as I said at the beginning of the video makes Irish Celtic history infinitely more complex and difficult to sort of weave and get your head around. It's going to take a while. I'm going to have to basically, as it's why I chose to do an analysis of every individual tribe. I could just sit here and do a paint a broad picture and go, Irish culture is Celtic culture. It survives there. There you go. Ireland is Celtic. Celts were never a unified people. Put the pieces together yourself. I felt that looking at the bigger picture, you're missing the detail. It's more complex than just saying you are Irish Celtic. You were more. It was There was something more to it. The, there was no sense that Ireland was a nation. It was maybe us and them, maybe, but there wasn't a set. You weren't you weren't Irish, you were, as I said, you were Dorini. Later you will be Ulster, Munster, whatever. You you weren't a united people. And it was the same in the rest of the Celtic world. In France, there was no sense of being French. It's, it's not like the whole of the borders of France purely were where the Romans looked at as a country. That's not how it works. And when they came to Britain, there wasn't a line on the ground between England and Scotland where they thought, stop there, that's a different country, we're not invading that. Every time you encountered another tribal kingdom, you were invading a different country and you had to make a decision whether or not you were going to make them a client state or you were going to outright invade them. And they basically stopped at what is now Scotland because the Scottish put up too much resistance and that alone as a factor was probably enough to dissuade them from invading Ireland as it had been a it had been a monumental task that had been difficult the Romans had tried several times to invade Britain they hadn't finished here they weren't moving on to Ireland as well that would be two overseas wars they'd have to fight and the Romans were not exactly a good naval power as I said they're a fantastic people but they're overrated in a lot of ways now, just quickly going back to linguistics, with the Dorini concerned, their name, Dare, Dorini, Dorin, whatever you, there are many variations, was somewhat equated to the Roman god of Mars, meaning it was a war god. There was This is an indication that perhaps the Dorini were a more warlike people. There are also various other places, particularly in Scotland and in Ireland, particularly in Munster, as there is the area of Dundrum, which derives its name from Dare. But is likely not directly connected to the Dorini, more likely just connected to the god that they were named after, just another place named after the same god. As for their capital, it may have been the stronghold of the fort of Dorini, which was has become Dundrum Castle, which may have been their capital or at least a major stronghold of the Dorini tribe. However, despite the fact that this is in County Down, it is a little far south. It may have been but it's hard to say. The problem with this tribe is much of the true extent of their territorial borders are a little vague. It's likely that being a small tribe in Ireland, their border probably swayed a little bit over time, but this may have been their, their capital as referenced by certain external forces like the Romans. It's possible. They certainly obviously had settlements. They lived somewhere, right? So anyway, as I said at the beginning of this video, Irish Celtic history is complicated and difficult to wrap your head around and it's going to take a lot of these to put it together as I feel that it's it's wrong to just categorize it all as one big sort of set and just go Irish Celtic history they're they're Celts they're Irish there you go they weren't always united you're not seeing by by looking at the bigger picture, by the broader strokes, you're missing the detail and by missing the foundations of what would be Irish Celtic culture, you're missing the point of it and you're not fully comprehending the beauty and history that is that magnificent period of history that's often overlooked. And it's the same across Britannia. It's not appreciated that the English and the Welsh, for that matter, have a strong Ar Celtic history as well. It's just not prevalent in modern society and as and the strong identification of the Scottish and the Irish as being Celtic and the English historically being arrogant bastards who just didn't want to admit such a historical connection. And I blame the Victorians, which in future videos I will go into with Victorian prudishness and short-sightedness and arrogance. 
I blame heavily on, and I use as a strong criticism of our modern interpretation of history. We like to focus on certain selected bits that are based on the educational system created by the Victorians that's not reflective of our true history. In Ireland, they do embrace their Celtic history much more, but it's still heavily not explored because people tend to not look past or much past St. Patrick and the introduction of Christianity. Everything before that is almost seen as barbaric and I think that's unfair. So for me I'm doing this series to break down who every individual tribe were and even though we don't know much about all of them we do what we do know I'll try and share. What I don't know I'm learning and I'm integrating into this because Irish history not being Irish I'm not an expert, at least not a complete expert. I am something of an armchair historian. Much of this information has been researched online. I do know something of a more modern history, but as I'm trying to do the prehistory, you're coming with me on that journey. I tend to know a little bit more about the Gauls, British, well, English, Scottish, and Welsh history than I necessarily do about Irish. But as it's all connected, you can't understand one without understanding the other. It's like just reading half a page or half a book you don't what's the point so there we have it please like share subscribe comment down below before this video gets too long all the mispronunciations feel free to correct me in the comments i'll try and remember to read them i am trying but i'm not irish and i'm not celtic and this accent does not lend itself very well to pronouncing anything other than English words and even then I'm told I pronounce things a little weird for example I say vitamin I grew up with American television like share subscribe comment down below and bye bye